Hi, I'm David Wiley, and this is everything you always wanted to know about OER but were afraid to ask. This presentation is itself an OER, and there is lots of information available in the notes uh, section of the slides. So I'd encourage you to check out the link in the video description below and grab a copy of the slides for yourself. I've structured this presentation around a series of questions, of course, because it is about all the questions that you've uh, always been afraid to ask. And so I'll just give you a quick preview of those here. And we will jump right into it. So aren't OER just free online textbooks? Well, I would ask, have you heard the joke about the Holy Roman Empire? This joke is attributed to Voltaire, who said that the Holy Roman Empire was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. And uh, I think there's a similarity here with open educational resources. OER aren't always textbooks, they aren't always online, and they aren't always free. So what are open educational resources then? Well, according to a definition that's used by a lot of organizations, including Creative Commons and the Hewlett Foundation, OER are teaching, learning, and research materials that are either in the public domain or are licensed in a manner that provides everyone with free and perpetual permission to engage in the 5R activities. So let's unpack that for a second. You'll notice here that OER are resources that are either in the public domain or are licensed in a particular manner. In other words, the OERness of a resource is solely a function of the copyright permissions uh, that are available to you because the resource is either in the public domain, meaning that there are no copyright related restrictions on how you can use it, or it's licensed in a particular manner. Two, these permissions must be granted to you for free, and the grant of these permissions must be perpetual. That means you have to have these permissions as long as the copyright lasts on the work that you want to use. And finally, this free permission that you have for the term of the copyright uh, must give you permission to engage in what we call the 5R activities. So what are the 5R activities? The first, 5R, the first of the 5Rs is retain. Retain means that you have permission to make, own, and keep a copy of the resource. You can download your own copy right to your computer, to your phone, to your tablet, and you can keep it forever. It won't delete itself. It won't stop working after six months. It's not a subscription service. You have to keep paying month after month for access to you just get to download a good old-fashioned copy and keep it forever. Now, with that copy that you have retained, you can revise uh, that copy. You can edit, adapt it, and modify it to meet whatever need you have. For example, translating it into another language. You can also remix the copy that you've downloaded, like taking that resource and combining that uh, with some other resource in order to create something new, uh, a mashup, you might say. Uh, reuse is the fourth R, and by reuse we mean that you can take either the original copy that you made, your revised copy, or a remixed copy, and you can use that resource publicly. You can post it on a public website, you can include it in a public presentation, things like that. And then the final R is redistribute. Redistribute means you can take either that original copy that you downloaded, or your revised, or your remixed copy, and you can make more copies of those and give them away uh, to other people to download and keep themselves uh, by posting it online, for example. So these are the five R's. So let's come back to this idea that OER aren't always textbooks, they aren't always online, and they aren't always free. And look at that uh, with a couple of examples. First, think about printed OER textbooks. Are they textbooks? Yes. but. Are they online? They're not online because they're printed. And are they free? No, they're not free because ink and paper cost money. But we would still call these OER because the content in them is openly licensed. Uh, in this example, the textbooks available from OpenStax are openly licensed. So even though they're not available online and they're not available for free in the case of printed textbooks, we would still call them OER. Uh, think about adaptive OER courseware. It's courseware, it's definitely not a textbook, it's something uh, more than a textbook. It is available online, uh, but again, it's not available for free. But we would still call this OER because the content is openly licensed and you have all 5R permissions with regard to content in OER courseware. As a final example, interactive OER simulations. 
Uh, are these textbooks? No, they aren't. Uh, but are they online? Yes. Are they free? Yes. But we call them OER because the content is openly licensed. That's what makes the difference. It's not about being a textbook. It's not about being online. It's not about being free. As long as the content is openly licensed, it's proper to call the resource an open educational resource. So how can you tell the difference between something that's free and something that's actually open? Generally speaking, you want to look for a Creative Commons license. The Creative Commons license indicates to you that you have permission to engage in these 5R activities. So as you're thinking about the difference between things that are free and things that are open, I think it's really useful to consider this two by two table. Uh, in the columns, we have things that are either free or that cost money. And in the rows, we have things that are all rights reserved, uh, traditionally copyrighted materials. And in the bottom row, we have things that are openly licensed using a Creative Commons license that grants you the 5R permissions. Now in the top left-hand corner here, we have things that are all rights reserved and with $0 and a little asterisk next to that. So library resources that students at a university might use, for example, those are resources that students experience as being free. Now we understand that students are paying for those resources by tuition or by a library fee, but students' experience of it is that it's free. Also, most of the resources on the internet are available for free. You don't pay to log in and read the news on your favorite news website, possibly, or to watch videos uh, on YouTube, for example. These, this yellow box, yellow box represents materials that are fully copyrighted, all rights reserved, uh, and available for free. The green box at the bottom, this is in the column of things that are free and the row of things that are OER, uh, are materials that would be available for free, for example, a PDF that you might download of some content that was openly licensed. So this green box would be something that's free and is OER. The top right hand corner, uh, say a, a textbook that you might get from a traditional publisher, definitely all rights reserved, definitely a cost, a lot of cost associated with that. The bottom right hand corner, the blue box, OER available in print or OER available in courseware. That content is still openly licensed, so it's in that bottom row, but there is some cost associated with it, so it's in the right hand column. So just think about these two columns of free versus some cost, all rights reserved versus uh, openly licensed. Everything in this bottom row, everything that is licensed in a way that provides you with the 5R permissions is an OER. Now, why would anyone give away their hard work for free? Um, I think it's useful when you think about this question to separate out the payment that you might receive to create materials versus the payment that might be made to you in terms of royalties uh, afterward. Many OER creators are paid, and we'll talk about that, but all OER creators forego royalties. Once that is openly licensed and out the door, anyone can copy it, anyone can adapt it, anyone can reuse it uh, for free. That's what it means to be available as OER. So a lot of OER creators are paid to create. They receive a grant to create OER from a, a philanthropic foundation, uh, from a, a government, or from their institution. They might be commissioned to create OER by an organization like Lumen or OpenStax. And for the majority of faculty, their role includes time to create materials for their classes. So material that they're creating as part of their teaching role, they can choose to turn around and put an open license on. Instead of royalty payments, uh, when you create OER, you won't look for payment on the, on the backside of that in terms of royalty, but there are a lot of benefits of creating OER, like invitations to speak at a conference or to publish in special issues of journals, uh, consulting opportunities that might come available, invitations to contribute to strategic uh, or planning or other kinds of processes on your campus or in your professional society or organization, and then thank you emails from faculty and students who find the material that you've created and just want to say thanks. Uh, those are some uh, really amazing and heartwarming emails to receive. But then it's also true that there are some people who are not supported in any way who just volunteer their time and effort to create OER. And they do that for the same range of reasons that other people volunteer to spend their time serving in other ways. 
Now, won't free or low cost materials be worse at supporting student learning than more expensive materials? Don't you get what you pay for? No, in short. Uh, dozens of peer reviewed uh, published studies, including over 100,000 students, overwhelmingly show there's no significant difference in student outcomes when their faculty adopt OER in place of traditionally copyrighted materials. Uh, there are some studies that show that OER users learn more than the users of traditionally copyrighted materials. There are also a few studies that show that TCM users learning, uh, users learning more than OER users, but the overwhelming majority of the studies show no significant difference. Uh, this uh, series of studies by my colleague John Hilton uh, wraps up this research and reviews, uh, as you can see here, this is a, a, research, a review of research on the efficacy of open educational resources. Uh, this runs uh, from about 2012 up through 2016 or so, and then he published a follow-on study going picking up things that were published in 2015 and bringing that up to 2018. If you're interested in the empirical research on the impacts on student learning of open educational resources, I definitely suggest that you check out uh, these two summary articles. Uh, now, you might ask, don't OER improve student learning simply by expanding access to required materials? Intuitively, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, however, in this study published by uh, Phil Grimaldi and uh, other researchers from OpenStax, they actually demonstrate uh, that at least from a research perspective, this isn't true. Um, they call this the access hypothesis, and they say the access hypothesis states that OER benefits learning by providing access to critical course materials. But they demonstrate that even if there is such a benefit, uh, it's likely so small that standard research methods aren't able to detect it, and they go on to demonstrate in the article why that's true. So students will always save money when their faculty adopt OER. That's uh, also well borne out in the research. But student outcomes will only improve when faculty adopt more effective pedagogical practices and students adopt more effective study practices. That's when learning improves. Just how much money do students save when their faculty adopt OER? Data collected by Spark in 2018 from a representative national sample of campus bookstores shows that students save over $116 per course when their faculty adopt OER. And again, the details for this research are in the slide notes. So students whose faculty adopt OER save a ton of money and have the same learning outcomes. Mission accomplished? I'm gonna say no. 40% um, of first time in college students drop out of higher ed completely before they finish their first two terms. Uh, and graduation within six years from four-year degree programs is not great. Uh, overall, you're looking at 60%, and depending on uh, racial breakout, you can be looking at far lower rates of success than that. And the situation is even worse looking at graduation within three years from a two-year degree program. 30% overall. These, these rates are bad. And I don't think that our work with OER can culminate in us saying, hey, look, same results, but we made it more affordable. I think there's more work for us to do here, and um, I'm pretty excited about that. So if our real goal is to improve student learning, why are we talking about OER and licensing? We've just said that they don't make a difference. Um, if you don't know Herbert Simon, Herbert Simon's a pretty interesting character, and I'd encourage you to spend a minute and learn a little bit about him. He won both the Turing Award in Computer Science and the Nobel Prize for his work in economics. He also made uh, pretty significant, contrib significant contributions to education. And Simon said that learning results from what the student does and thinks, and only from what the student does and thinks. And the teacher can advance learning only by influencing what the student does to learn. So when all you do is swap out OER for TCM, and neither the faculty's teaching practices nor the student's study practices change, that they both just keep doing what they were doing before, we shouldn't expect learning to improve. More has to happen than just adopting OER if we wanna see learning outcomes get better for students. Well, what do copyright, license, copyright and licensing even have to do with pedagogy? 
We said uh, a few minutes ago that open licenses of OER give us permission to engage in activities that we can't engage with with traditionally copyrighted materials, and we talked about those five R's. Um, I, I like to think about the relationship between open and pedagogy this way. If, as Simon and others have said, we learn by the things we do, if that's true, and I think it is, it's certainly true that copyright restricts what we're permitted to do without going and getting permission and paying licensing fees and things like that. If those first two things are true, then it must be the case that copyright restricts the ways that we're able to learn, the ways that we're permitted to learn. Open licenses remove those restrictions, giving us those five R permissions and permitting us to do new things. And if we can do new things and we learn by the things we do, then OER might enable us to learn in new ways. So let me give you two examples of that very quickly. And again, there's detail in the slide notes here if you want to explore further. The first is uh, a course I used to teach when I was still full-time faculty called Project Management for Instructional Designers. As you might imagine, uh, there's not a big market for a book called Project Management for Instructional Designers. And when I started teaching this class, no book like that existed. There were openly licensed project management textbooks written for other contexts, like the business school context, but nothing for the students I was teaching who were you know, learning how to design effective instruction. So what we did in this course was I worked together with students to rewrite the textbook in order to turn it from a project management book for the business school into a project management book for people who are designing online learning and engaging in other kinds of instructional design uh, work. So students rewrote case studies, they rewrote examples, they filmed video interviews with practicing instructional designers and got them talking specifically about how the principles described in the book applied to instructional designers. We did a lot of work on this book over several semesters. And I hope it's clear that you can only do this kind of revising and remixing of a textbook that is openly licensed. The, the five R permissions we had with regard to that first OER that we found are what made it possible for us to turn this into the resource that we needed to be. Uh, we were then able to publish it and it's now used at a couple of other universities around the country where a similar course is taught and other people are able to benefit from that work that we did, and so that's really exciting. Uh, another example that I'll give, this is, is an assignment I used to really enjoy giving, where I'd ask students to go find either some old public domain video or some newer openly licensed video and record new audio over top of that video to make the video talk about something completely different than it was talking about in the first case. Uh, here, this is an example from a course I used to teach on new media and learning. That tells you how long ago it was that we were still, still calling blogs and wikis new media. Uh, but instead of a two-page compare and contrast essay, convince me that you know the difference between blogs and wikis and how they're meaningfully uh, you know, different from and similar to each other, I gave this uh, assignment to go re-record audio over top of a video. And one group of students uh, found this old Nixon-Kennedy debate video and rewrote an all new script to go over top of it. They did uh, these really cheesy impersonations of their voices. Uh, I'd encourage you to take four and a half minutes and go watch this. Um, essentially, Nixon is arguing the merits of blogs because you can really control what happens there. You can control the information available uh, to the people and to the media. And Kennedy's talking about wikis and freedom of speech and participation and how wikis uh, really are better. Great closing line from Kennedy in this video. I won't spoil it for you. But again, this is the kind of work that can only be done when you have permission to do this kind of work, when you have these five R uh, permissions. And this work also, I hope uh, if you get a chance to watch the video, you'll see how engaging and interesting it is. And you think about the effort that went into producing this video compared to the amount of effort that would have gone into writing a two page compare and contrast about blogs versus wikis. And you can see there's a lot more effort, there's a lot more thought, um, there's just, it's just better quality work. And it also, uh, you can see down here at the bottom right, it's homework that doesn't get written, handed back and thrown away. It actually has a life outside the classroom. This video has been viewed over 52,000 times. And it's just a little video about the difference between blogs versus wikis that students did for a class assignment. There's lots of power here in engaging 
collectively in the work that we can do when we have the 5R permissions. So this is how uh, OER open licenses, those 5R permissions, really give us genuinely new opportunities to engage in new activities impacting our teaching and learning. Finally, what's the relationship between open licensing and creating more effective learning resources? Because you'll hear that OER can be more effective. How does that work? Well, learning analytics, uh, something like RISE analysis, for example, can be used to identify the least effective OER in a course. Once you've identified those OER that really aren't supporting student learning effectively, the 5R permissions that open licenses grant us make it possible for us to improve those OER. And this ongoing iterative cycle of continuous improvement where we collect data, we look to see which OER really aren't doing a great job of supporting student learning, we improve those, we put them back out in the course the next time it's taught the next term, and run this loop. This cycle of continuous improvement can make OER more effective every term that you teach with it. Uh, an example of this. Here is an example of some OER, uh, in this case from OpenStax that uh, Lumen used when we first built some of our uh, economics courseware. And we noticed in the data that students were having trouble understanding this notion of a price ceiling. And when we went in to look at the content, we saw, man, there, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot of description. This graph is pretty complicated. If you're not an engineer or a person who is really comfortable with numbers and graphing, there's a lot to unpack in this graph. And we kind of targeted this graph is probably what students were struggling with uh, as they were trying to master this concept of price ceilings. And so what we did was we took that graph and improved it. We improved it by breaking it down into its individual parts and making an interactive activity out of it. So that activity starts, as you can see here, with just a demand curve intersecting a supply curve at an equilibrium point. This is something that students should know by this point in the course. And we show them the simplified version, ask them some questions to make sure that they're under understanding correctly. And if they don't, we immediately let them know that they misunderstand and we correct the misunderstanding right there with immediate targeted feedback. And then students are able to move through this interactive, building up the graph a little bit at a time with new questions to make sure they're understanding each thing that's happening until eventually they arrive at the full graph and they're able to really understand everything that's happening there in a way that's scaffolded and supported instead of kind of putting the whole graph on them uh, at once. This is a, a great example of what continuous improvement looks like. So that's a lot. Uh, how do we summarize that very quickly? I'd summarize uh, everything you always wanted to know about OER really in three key points. First, that the five R permissions that we have access to with OER are what give OER their transformative potential. The second is that when faculty adopt OER, their students will save money. And the third and the most important one, and the one that we need to pay more attention to collectively, is that student outcomes will only improve when OER adoption is combined with the adoption of more effective teaching and learning practices. And OER give us lots of opportunity to do that. I'm David Wiley. Thanks very much for joining me.